Bonjour, merci de nous rejoindre en salle de presse en direct sur OBS pour notre rendez-vous de presse quotidien. Nous sommes le jeudi 25 juin. Nous avons quelques annonces à vous faire. First, let me share with you an update to the President's agenda for this week. President von der Leyen is, missing, is meeting sorry, this evening with the Prime Minister of Kosovo, Abdullah Hoti, who is visiting Brussels for the first time since he took office. On Friday morning, the President will receive uh, the President of Serbia, Alexander Vucic. Commissioner Vaheli will also hold separate meetings <coughs> with both interlocutors during their visit in Brussels. I now call Virginie, um, who is on screen, for an announcement on the Sudan Partnership Conference, which is taking place today. Virginie. Uh, oui, bonjour, vous m'entendez? Um, so uh, today the European Union will co-host um, the high-level um, uh, conference of the Sudan Partnership Conference. Um, co -host, this will be co-hosted by the European Union, uh, Sudan, the United Nations and Germany. Sudan has a historic opportunity to transform uh, into a democratic society. Uh, and the European Union supports the consolidation of the civilian-led uh, transition in the country by accompanying um, the political and economic uh, reforms in the country and by being a key partner for the authorities. Um, over uh, 50 countries uh, in and international organization will participate in today's conference uh, and the event will be opened by a panel discussion between uh, Abdallah Hamdok, the Prime Minister of Sudan, High Representative Vice President Joseph Borrell, uh, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Germany, Heiko Maas, and the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. The discussion will take stock of the achievements um, of the Sudanese political uh, transition so far, uh, as well as the uh, challenges ahead. The European Union pledge will be delivered by Commissioner uh, for International Partnership, Jutta Upelainen, and Commissioner for Crisis Management, Janis Lenocic. Uh, the funds that will be pledged uh, will support social and economic development, the ambitious reforms of the civilian-led transitional government, and as well as transition stability and peace. Uh, we will publish uh, press material after the conference with more details at the end of the day. Thank you. Pour Virginie, j'appelle maintenant Stéphane pour une annonce sur la signature d'un accord dans le domaine de l'aviation entre l'Union européenne et la Corée. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, the European Union and the Republic of Korea have signed a horizontal aviation agreement. This agreement allows all EU airlines to fly to the Republic of uh, Korea from each EU member state that has concluded with the Republic a bilateral air services agreement. To date, 22 member states have signed such bilateral air services agreements with the Republic. Before we had uh, this um, horizontal aviation agreement concluded, what happened was that when there was a bilateral air service agreement between a member state and the Republic, only airlines owned by that member state or controlled by this member state could then fly to and from that member state to the Republic of Korea. But thanks to this horizontal aviation agreement, now all EU airlines can fly from member states with a bilateral agreement with the Republic. So the conclusion of this horizontal aviation agreement offers quite some important opportunities to all EU airlines and is beneficial to airlines on both sides. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, this brings us to the end of our announcement for today. We are ready for your questions um, and I move to Jacques Parok. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, go ahead, Jack. Yes, go ahead, Jack. Hi. Um, so my question is on the um, the charges against the Kosovo president Hashim Tachi. We were wondering if there's any response 
on uh, how that might change the way that Europe participates in those negotiations, whether you think it's right that he's not travelling to the US to take part in those talks tomorrow, um, yeah, and just an update on, on how the EU sees that, that set of charges against the Kosovo president. Thank you. Question for Peter. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. On the indictment announced uh, yesterday, we can only say that uh, this was done by the Specialist Prosecutor Office and the Specialist Chambers, and they are independent institution. Uh, we are not commenting on uh, their actions, but I can say that the EU is strongly supporting this institution because it's an important institution. On uh, all the other questions regarding the meeting in uh, Washington, you know that EU is not part of that meeting, so that's not up to us to comment, but you notice that uh, the representatives of Kosovo uh, withdrew from it and are not traveling. What is important for us is uh, to focus on the EU-facilitated dialogue, and this is what we are doing. And uh, we still think that uh, what the USR uh, Miroslav Lajčák has uh, announced after his meetings, both in Pristina and Belgrade, uh, that uh, the dialogue uh, should resume okay, in, should July resume in, in July in Brussels. Thank you. Now, are there other questions on uh, these meetings um, tomorrow before we move to other themes? So I would ask only those who have a question on this to keep their hand raised for the moment. Thank you. Dujan. You have the floor. Press speak. There you go. Yes, you hello. Go. Uh, you hear me now? Um, so the, 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 the follow-up question is, how will these uh, charges uh, against President Tachi impact the, the dialogue and uh, will uh, the, the president be still a valid collocator for the European Union, uh, given this uh, new reality. And given that he still has a prominent role uh, uh, in uh, Kosovo political life, of course, uh, and in the governing coalition, how do you think this can impact the, the next stages in the dialogue? Thank you, Dushan. Thank you, Dushan. The EU and we repeat it very many times. Very many times. Just switch off your mind, maybe, please. Yeah, please. Thank you. The EU, and we keep repeating it all the time, is very committed to continue our engagement as a facilitator of, uh, of the dialogue between uh, Belgrade and Pristina. But um, we are not the ones who are dictating who are our interlocutors. It is uh, not for the EU to choose the interlocutors. It is, for, in this case, for Kosovo um, and uh, its authorities to decide how their interests would be served in a best way and represented in the best way. So again, we are the facilitator who deals with partners, but we are not choosing this partner. So it's up to the partners and authorities in, on, on both sides to provide the interlocutors for us. And on the wider question of um, the internal political um, impact of these uh, of this events and of this indictment, um, the expectation of the EU is um, that um, Kosovo authorities will continue to uphold their commitments uh, towards the rule of law, towards the work and the mandate of the Specialist Prosecutor Office. And uh, I think everybody is aware that the uh, Kosovo government, uh, similarly to any other government basically all around the world, has a lot to do in terms of tackling the impact and consequences of the coronavirus uh, crisis. So the authorities uh, and their representatives need to devote all their energy, all their attention, and uh, all their focus on these issues, that means health-related issues, economy-related issues, social uh, issues, uh, fight against anti-corruption, etc., in addition uh, to the dialogue of, uh, with, the, with Serbia. So these are tasks which require enormous amount of energy and attention, and uh, this is the expectation of the European Union that the Kosovo authorities will will basically be dealing with it uh, in earnest and will be very serious in focusing all the energies to solve these issues. Thank you, Peter. Um, a technical comment, if I may, before we move on to the next questions. Uh, quite a few of you are commenting rightly on the fact that there's an echo. Just please make sure that once you have asked your question, you immediately uh, push the speak button again to switch off your microphone. We try to do it from here centrally. 
Um, but um, if we're not able to do it sufficiently quickly, then um, then uh, you stay on. So please switch off your mic after you have asked your question uh, so that we do not have to do it here because it can be more messy. Thank you. Now, other questions on uh, tomorrow's meeting only uh, for the moment, please. We're still on the same um, subject. Um, Odile, no? Okay. Ekrem. You have the floor. Ekrem, press speak. Do you hear me? You. Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, still a question for uh, Peter. Uh, what makes you so confident, and Mr. Lachak as well, that uh, the leaders from Pristina of Kosovo will come to the EU mediated talks next month if they uh, cancel the meeting in Washington, White House? Yeah, I'm waiting for you to switch off. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, there is only... There is only... Maybe, if, yeah, okay. Um, when we talk about the normalization between Kosovo and Pristina, uh, between Kosovo and, and Serbia, we are talking about the EU-facilitated dialogue. There is no alternative to the EU-facilitated dialogue to address the normalization of relations between Kosovo and Serbia. That is why uh, we have the commitment from both sides as communicated uh, recently to the EUSR Lajčák, both in Pristina and Belgrade, commitment of both sides to resume the dialogue. We expect that uh, it would happen in July. And if it doesn't happen in July, you know, these are all speculations. Let's not jump ahead of the events. We have the commitment from both sides, and both sides know that there is huge need to restart the dialogue for the benefit of people in, on both sides and that uh, at one point the dialogue would need to be resumed if both sides are to progress on their path towards normalization and also towards the European Union, because in the end it's about their European future, and the European future for people in Kosovo and Serbia leads through the dialogue which is facilitated by the, by the EU. So, and there is no impact whatsoever about uh, cancellation of the event planned in Washington because, uh, as I said, there is only one EU-facilitated dialogue which requires commitment from both sides and facilitation by the EU, which is still there and we are, st we are still committed to proceed. Okay. Um, Ekrem, I see you still have your hand raised. Is that, you want to follow up? Yes, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. I, Peter, I understand the commitment we made but Lowe's commitment made to Washington just changed uh, yesterday, just uh, when President Pachi was on his way already. Now, the question, I'll make the question the other way around. Uh, reading a reaction from Kosovo, now it seems that the Prime Minister uh, uh, Hoti, who is today in, 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 in Brussels, will be under an extreme pressure of coming to the talks uh, uh, mediated by the EU uh, alone. Because the, 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 there was always like uh, this idea in Kosovo that the team uh, represented Kosovo should be uh, included, not uh, in this particular situation created yesterday without the uh, president who is indicted. Well, but again, this is something for, for our partners in Kosovo to sort out uh, internally. We are there, the table is ready, the dates can be agreed. And uh, it's not up to us to point out and choose the interlocutors. In this case, it's for Kosovo to choose and decide who will be representing, under current circumstances, the interests of Kosovo in the best way that the dialogue can move on. And this is the key task, to resume the dialogue. Thank you. I think we have exhausted uh, this issue, so let us move on. Um, are there other questions on the meeting tomorrow itself? Girakina, is it on the meeting? Or, an, go ahead. No, it's not, it was just a follow-up for Peter, if I may. All right, go ahead. Okay, Peter. If you say that uh, you can set the dates, dates were already set according to, the, to Miroslav Lajčak, who said last week that he has the dates and he has the willingness of the parties. 
Uh, according to what you said so far, is it fair to say that you still aim to respect the timetable concerning dialogue and have at least one meeting during July? Well, let me be clear. There was no timetable. There was determination and willingness to proceed and have a, have a date and have a meeting in uh, Brussels in July. The determination, at least on our side, is still there. And the understanding from the talks between the EUSR and his partners, both in Pristina and Belgrade, was that they are committed to come and to do it. So we hope this will still be the case. And again, uh, as I said previously, even if it's not happening on that particular date, which uh, we had in mind, and was not communicated or announced officially at this stage because we will do it closer to the date as we always do. There will be another day because there is no alternative to this dialogue. There is no alternative to the resumption of the dialogue. So whether it happens on the 1st, on the 10th or on the 30th, at one point it will need to happen if both sides are serious about moving forward on their European path. Thank you. Now I think we move on to other Balkan questions. I know that Tanya has a question on Serbia. Uh, no, not on, not on Serbia. It's, it's Tanya Milevska from the Macedonian News Agency. I have a question on Macedonia, on North Macedonia. Uh, so the Commissioner Varheri has been um, announcing the negotiations framework for North Macedonia and Albania for like three weeks. And he keeps saying that it will be in the few, next few days. In the next few days, uh, it will be in June. And here we are on the 25th of June. There are five days left until the end of June. So I would really like to know uh, when this negotiations framework will be um, uh, announced and and whether it will happen in June. And where is the problem? Why? Wh what's the blockage? Why are why why is it being delayed all the time? Thank you. Anna. So, Tanya, many thanks for your questions. I think, uh, like I already had the chance to um, explain to you in the last few days, uh, the Commission is still actually uh, working on the uh, texts of the uh, of the drafts negotiating frameworks. We are currently uh, finalizing uh, the documents. Um, I cannot give you a date when they will be presented. Um, it's clear that our aim is to be able to do it as soon as possible. You know that uh, these draft uh, texts will need to be presented to the Council. And our aim is, of course, to be able to finalize this work and uh, be able to send them to the Council as soon as possible. Thank you, Anna. Um, OK, let us move on. You have a follow-up. Go ahead. Just a short follow-up. So, so not necessarily June. It could be next month then, right? At this stage, we're, we're not going to be giving dates. I think enough dates have been given. Let us finalize the work, and uh, we will make the announcement when the proposals are, when the mandates are ready. Thank you. Let us move on to other subjects now. Odile. Bonjour. Um, lors de sa récente visite en France, le président tunisien, uh, Kais Saeb, a proposé qu'une des solutions au conflit libyen serait peut-être de rassembler les différentes tribus de la Libye. En effet, pour le président tunisien, ce sont les Libyens seuls, en dehors de toute intervention étrangère, qui doivent déterminer l'avenir de leur pays. Uh, Est-ce que vos services travaille éventuellement sur cette proposition euh, émise par le président tunisien, en, en plus de l'opération Irini euh, pour, sur le contrôle des armes, euh, pour lequel d'ailleurs le haut représentant vient de remercier euh, le ministre de la Défense euh, grec Panagopoulos pour ce, la contribution de la, de la, de la, de la marine grecque euh, à l'opération Irini. Merci. Merci. Uh, bien sûr, uh, la solution en Libye doit être pour les Libyens et préparée par les Libyens. C'est une position que nous avons défendue uh, toujours. Et sur la solution, sur le plan des solutions ou les intentions pour la solution, nous avons aussi toujours dit, et c'est notre position aujourd'hui aussi, que on doit trouver la solution dans le processus politique, dans le cadre des processus de Berlin, qui uh, a lieu uh, sur les hospices des Nations Unies. Merci, Peter. Uh, y a-t-il d'autres questions en relation internationale So let's finish on international relations for the moment. Um, 
Momchil. International relations, huh? Press speak. Yes, okay. Do you hear me now? Is it on international, relations? On international relations? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, uh, on uh, 1st July, there will be a referendum in Russia. And um, according and many people consider it like a referendum for for Putin to stay indefinitely in power. Uh, does the European Commission has any assessment about this uh, referendum? Thank you, Peter. Okay, Thank thanks, you, Peter. Okay. Um Indeed, we are watching uh, very carefully the preparations for the process of the nationwide vote on the amendments on the Russian Constitution. There are various amendments sub submitted. And um, one of them, I will not comment on the one which you just mentioned, because I think the, the length of uh, term of office of leaders is for countries to decide. But uh, the one uh, amendment which um, is particularly interesting from our point of view is uh, the one on making the, making the or ensuring the primacy of the Russian constitution over the international uh, law and over the decision of the international courts. And uh, this amendment uh, is based on the opinion of the Venice Commission, not in line with uh, Russia's international commitments. So uh, this we are watching uh, very carefully, very intensively, and we hope and we expect Russia to do everything necessary to maintain the um, legal framework in place that would ensure the, that the commitments, the international commitments of uh, Russia are being upheld. Thank you, Peter. So still continuing with international relations, so only keep your hand raised if it's on that. Tommaso. You have the floor. You have the floor. Good morning. Uh, I hope it's for uh, international relations. It concerns the lifting of the travel restrictions on the 1st July. No, it's not. Hold on, let's, uh, let's see if we're finished on, with that. Let's see if we're finished with that. You. Uh, Momshi, you had a follow-up, perhaps? E yes, I have a follow-up. Uh, I mean about the terms of Putin. Uh, Peter, you just, told, uh, you just said that uh, the length of the presidential terms are up to the states, but... Uh, I think that uh, every European state has uh, some uh, limitations for the presidents, and uh, Russia practically does does not have some uh, such limitations. So that's the reason I am asking about the assessment of the European Commission, also of the of the terms of the Russian president. Uh, sorry, if I can uh, intervene here, Momshil, there are constitutional arrangements in EU member states, uh, and the European Union obviously. Uh, uh, is constituted of 27 member states. As far as I know, Russia is not uh, a member of the European Union. Its constitutional arrangement when it comes to its institutional setup are its own internal uh, affairs. What is clear is that when it comes to um, the international relations of, of Russia, which might therefore have an impact on the European Union, um, we may indeed well have, uh, well have something to say. But on whether there should be a, a limited number of terms for a president or not, uh, this is not something for which the European Union uh, should have something to say, simply because there are different arrangements, possibly, um, in the European Union. There are no links between the two issues. Right. Um, okay, Mira. Question on international affairs. International affairs. Seem to be the case. Okay, so uh, Tommaso, we come back to your question on the um, restrictions to entry. Go ahead. Yeah, it was just because we understand that the ambassadors are working on the criteria uh, to uh, write a list of the countries uh, with which the restrictions, the travel restrictions would be lifted. I just, we understand also that uh, the U.S. Would, would not be on that list. 
and that China might be on that list. I, I guess that the ambassadors are working to avoid this, this outcome, which might be politically undesirable. I just wonder if the Commission thinks that it, the EU might lift the travel restriction vis-à-vis -vis China and not to lift them vis-à-vis -vis the United States. Thank you. Albert. Uh, thank you, Tommaso. Um, as, uh, as you know, the process for agreeing on this, um, on the progressive lifting of the travel restriction uh, is as follows. We, from the Commission side, have uh, proposed a, uh, an approach with criteria and a coordination mechanism on the 11th of June, um, with, a, um, with the approach being based on a common list agreed by the member states based on objective criteria. And there's a set of uh, criteria that we suggest member states should use, including epidemiological criteria, of course, given that uh, health is, is, our, is our main concern, but also, um, uh, also a number of other criteria relating, uh, among others, to the economic and social uh, considerations to, to take into account. Now, the, uh, the uh, decision on this issue is very firmly in the hands of the member states. Discussions are ongoing. Uh, there have been three Coropa meetings about this recently, and there will be uh, more uh, coming up. And at this stage, we have no uh, further details to share, and it's, it, is, it is too early also to comment on which countries would be included on this list. Um, from our side, we will continue supporting member states in uh, preparing to gradually lift uh, restrictions. And, um, and again, our main concern here is, is public health. And um, we will uh, also make sure that travelers are kept informed as we move ahead. Thank you. Erini, I think it's on the same issue. Yes, let's say it's um, on the same issue. If there is a specific decision on the Americans, but uh, Dalabert has just answered. But if we had kind of that decision, maybe US is going to apply on a number of tariffs on um, a number of EU products. What does it mean for the relations between EU and United States and how EU is going to react in such an occasion? Thank you. Sorry, Eini, do I understand well that you are making a link between the issue of the placing of the US on the, or not, on the list of countries which would be exempted from restrictions to travel and tariffs? In fact, such a, an announcement or that the uh, uh, U.S. is uh, thinking on imposing tariffs came uh, after um, New York Times uh, wrote that maybe Americans will be banned from entering EU. That's why I'm making a link. Look, we're certainly not going to go into speculation as to what motivates U.S. decisions on tariffs uh, in the area of trade of goods. Um, that might not be linked to trade-specific uh, issues. The fact remains that the European Union has an internal process to determine from which countries it would be safe to accept travelers also in cases not related to um, essential travel, and that, as Adalbert has just said, our internal process is uh, related, obviously, um, uh, to considerations based on health criteria. All the rest, um, in terms of what decisions the U.S. might take or not, is uh, speculation that we will not uh, get into and that will, in any case, not influence our internal process. Let me move now uh, to other questions uh, for um, Adalbert on this uh, issue or on other issues. So for Adalbert, I know that David has a question for Adalbert, so go ahead. Oui, merci, Eric. Euh, J'ai deux questions de, en fait, quatre questions de follow-up euh, au sujet de McKinsey. Euh, merci, Adalbert, pour euh, les infos et, que tu nous as euh, données euh, hier, à moi et à quelques autres journalistes. Euh, euh, pour avoir plus de précision, euh, Est-ce que c'est normal que des euh, sociétés de consultancy offrent de travailler pour la Commission à titre gratuit C'est-à-dire, est-ce que ça arrive souvent Combien de cas vous avez 
Deuxième question, est-ce que le secrétaire général de l'époque, on parle évidemment de 2016, ou le responsable de la Task Force Grèce ont eu des contacts avec McKinsey ou ont sollicité euh, cette société pour euh, travailler gratuitement euh, troisième question, j'ai bien compris que la Commission a la responsabilité ultime de ces propositions et, euh, et de ce document, mais comment c'est possible qu'une partie du texte de McKinsey a été copiée et collée dans un document de la Commission, vu que la Commission a 32 000 fonctionnaires qui sont sélectionnés et sont les meilleurs Apparemment, c'est la revendication que vous faites. Dernière question, c'est plus politique peut-être pour toi, Eric. Chaque fois qu'il y a un problème avec une agence, dans ce cas-ci, et Azo qui a donné un contrat à McKinsey, dans le passé Frontex, euh, 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 la commission dit « Ah non, 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 nous, on n'a rien à faire avec ça. C'est euh, des agences indépendantes. Euh, » Je voulais savoir pourquoi cette attitude quand, euh, en réalité, la, la, la Commission, après, euh, travaille avec les agences, il y a une dépendance, etc. Mais j'ai perdu ma connexion. Non, non, nous t'entendons. Oh, parfait, merci. C'est mon, mon ordinateur qui marche mal. Je ne voudrais pas que tu penses que euh, nous essayons de couper la ligne euh, quand les sujets sont, euh, sont délicats. Attention. Euh, la première chose que je voudrais dire, c'est qu'on euh, te remercie euh, de parler de la qualité des fonctionnaires européens. Nous ne prétendons certainement pas être... Euh, nous n'avons jamais prétendu ici être les, être les meilleurs fonctionnaires ou quoi que ce soit. Donc, s'il te plaît, euh, restons-en au, restons au fait. Euh, en ce qui concerne euh, la relation entre la Commission et les agences, elle est basée, euh, en ce qui concerne l'engagement de dépenses, sur euh, les décisions concernant les prérogatives de ces agences et le règlement financier. Je n'ai pas ici euh, les règles spécifiques qui, se, euh, qui ont trait à chacune des agences, mais lorsque nous faisons une affirmation sur ce podium ou dans une réponse aux journalistes sur le fait qu'une agence a engagé des dépenses et que ce n'est pas lié donc, à la Commission, c'est simplement basé sur le fait que c'est comme ça que les choses se passent en ce qui concerne les engagements financiers euh, de cette agence. Bien entendu, ensuite... La Commission et, euh, et les agences, et il y a différents types d'agences, sont amenés à coopérer euh, à divers titres sur les politiques, euh, sur les politiques euh, que mène euh, l'Union euh, européenne. Très souvent, les agences ont euh, des pouvoirs d'exécution. Euh, parfois, ce sont des agences qui fournissent des analyses, etc., etc., etc. Il faut regarder à chaque fois quel est le mandat spécifique de chaque, euh, de chaque agence. Euh, et donc c'est cela qui nous amène à répondre aux questions euh, telles que nous le euh, faisons. Sur les autres questions, je passe euh, la parole à Adalbert, mais euh, je tiens à dire qu'il me semble que certaines d'entre elles sont euh, extrêmement précises et demanderont euh, de, de la part d'Adalbert euh, un peu de travail de recherche. Donc je ne pense pas qu'il sera en mesure de répondre en détail ici sur le podium. En effet, je veux devoir revenir vers toi, David, sur, sur le détail de, de, de ce que tu me demandes. Euh, après, je pense que c'est quand même utile que je rappelle que de, du point de vue de la Commission, il est, il est absolument clair que la responsabilité euh, pour des politiques publiques telles que la, la gestion des migrations est, est très, très clairement avec les autorités publiques et la Commission, lorsque, lorsque c'est la Commission qui agit. Et lorsque nous, euh, nous faisons appel à une expertise externe, euh, c'est toujours euh, à la Commission ou aux autres autorités publiques d'évaluer euh, la, la contribution de ces acteurs extérieurs et de prendre leurs décisions sur les politiques de manière indépendante. Et euh, euh, par ailleurs, les, le, le plan d'action euh, sur la mise en œuvre de la euh, déclaration UE-Turquie à laquelle... Euh, auquel tu fais référence, est un document qui, est, qui a été élaboré de manière indépendante par la, la Commission et les autorités grecques et qui, d'ailleurs, suit un certain nombre d'autres documents politiques qui ont été présentés par, par la Commission, y compris des rapports sur la mise en œuvre du, du, du rapport UE, de la déclaration UE-Turquie euh, successif euh, que, que d'ailleurs, nous pouvons mettre à disposition très, très facilement. Euh, donc euh, voilà sur le, après sur le détail euh, de tes questions je, je reviendrai vers toi avec plaisir All right. other questions for Adalbert 
whilst he is on the podium. Athanasios. Thanks very much. Uh, we hear that uh, Director General of BG Home, Monique Paria, has sent a letter to the Greek minister responsible for asylum refugees, uh, Notis Mitarakis, expressing satisfaction for uh, some uh, sets of measures that were announced or implemented in the last couple of uh, months. Uh, could we be a little bit more precise? What exactly is in that letter? What was uh, the uh, uh, point of satisfaction for the uh, uh, Director General and uh, in what context is this exchange happening? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Athanasios. Um, look, we, we cooperate with uh, the Greek authorities very, very closely when it comes to um, migration management. You know, our role is one of uh, support and occasionally of advice as well as uh, of, of, of dialogue. Uh, and uh, the exchanges that we have uh, with the Greek authorities on all the different levels uh, are the context in which um, also this, this exchange of letters uh, is taking place. I am um, not really in a position to comment specifically on the content of, uh, of, of this uh, uh, particular exchange. Uh, what, what I can maybe say is that um, we, we are indeed, uh, um, I think, happy with uh, the fact that we, we cooperate very, very closely with the Greek authorities. Um, we are also, um, uh, of course, we, we of course commend the Greek authorities for uh, the efforts they're, they're undertaking in order to manage the, the migratory situation. Um, and we uh, continue to uh, remain at the Greek authorities' side and um, are ready to provide further support as, as needed as an appropriate. Um, but on the specific content of, of the letter, I, um, I do not have a comment at this point. Thank you. More questions for Albert. Yanis. We can't hear you, Yanis. Your mic is not enabled. I don't know if you can change that. Can you hear me now? Indeed. It. You can. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Uh, I'd like to revert to the, the issue of the external borders, please. Um, and I wanted to ask, uh, we understand that there wasn't much progress made between the ambassadors yesterday, and there's another meeting tomorrow, but the, the deadline of July the 1st is fast approaching. Is the Commission considering uh, urging an extension of the travel ban beyond the 30th of June, maybe to, towards the 15th of, of July? And are you concerned that uh, uh, some countries will move unilaterally after the 30th, which might then lead to a reclosing of borders inside the EU? Because that was also discussed yesterday. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Yanis. Well, first of all, I, I have to say that I'm really not the best place to give you a, um, a confirmation or otherwise of uh, what was discussed in, be, between the ambassadors uh, in, in Coripa. This is more a question to, to, the, to the Council, and uh, so I cannot really comment on the issue of uh, whether there was progress made uh, or not in, in this respect. Now, uh, for, uh, for what, what concerns possible uh, outcomes of this, uh, of this discussion, the, the, the discussions are very much in progress, so I also cannot really say what would happen under this or that scenario if, if an agreement is reached before the 1st of July or, or otherwise. What I can, however, tell you is that from the Commission's perspective, uh, it really is essential that um, we act on this issue in a coordinated way. Uh, and we've, uh, we've made this very clear in the, in the recommendation that we, um, uh, in the um, communication that we published on the uh, 11th of June. It was also an issue that was discussed here in the press room uh, when uh, Commissioner Johansson gave a press conference and there was an exchange on, on these issues. Um, it, is, uh, it is indeed uh, essential um, for the effectiveness of this uh, travel restriction uh, as well as for the integrity of the Schengen area that um, member states act uh, together on this. Uh, this said, what I can also add is that uh, the, there, we uh, have seen a very strong uh, political commitment from member states to continue acting uh, in, in a coordinated way on this issue, uh, right from the beginning of uh, the discussions on this travel restriction when it was uh, originally endorsed by the heads of state and government, and um, subsequently in the, uh, 
recurrent discussions that we have had with, um, uh, with ministers of Home Affairs about this issue. So um, from, from where I stand, uh, I, uh, I believe that we, we still uh, can count on that, uh, on that commitment of the member states and we will continue working with them based on that assumption. You have a follow-up, Yanis? Does not seem to be the case. Ekrem, you have a question as well. Fouad Albert. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, merci, Eric. Uh, uh, la question is sur le même contexte que Yanis uh, l'a posé, mais uh, sur le uh, six pays de, de, de Balkan. Uh, Adalbert, entre le 11 juin et aujourd'hui, il y a deux semaines. Et dans les six pays, surtout dans trois, quatre ou même au même niveau, de ce date, depuis le, que la, la date que la Commission a fait la, la, la recommandation, le nombre des infections euh, par coronavirus est en train d'augmenter, même dans certains pays, au même euh, euh, pourcentage ou chiffre qu'on a eu il y a deux, trois semaines. Donc, la question ici, ce n'est pas est-ce que les pays, est-ce que les pays membres vont décider demain, mais est-ce que la recommandation de la Commission est toujours valide ou pas euh, Merci beaucoup. Euh, tout ce que je peux dire pour l'instant est que, euh, est que la, la, la recommandation de la Commission euh, qui était faite le, le 11 juin a été basé à la fois sur des critères épidémiologiques et sur, euh, sur la, la considération de notre relation avec ces pays, euh, avec euh, la, la région, euh, pardon, euh, euh, dans son ensemble. Euh, depuis, euh, comme tu l'as souligné toi-même, c'est aux États membres de, de, de prendre la décision et de euh, la prendre aussi euh, en prenant en compte la... Euh, l'évolution de la situation épidémiologique qui est évidemment euh, est très étroitement surveillée par les États membres avec le soutien de la Commission et de, et de notre agence. Et comme ce sont des discussions qui sont, euh, qui sont en cours et qui sont entre les mains de, des États, euh, je, je ne peux pas faire de, de commentaires supplémentaires à ce stade. Merci. Yanis, um, you still have your hand raised. I don't know if you have a follow-up or, follow or not? I, I do, I do. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. The, the, the follow-up was the following. The, given the emphasis that the Commission uh, puts on the need for coordination, and given the fact that the, the member states seem to be no closer to agreement and we're only six, seven days out from the, from the date of the the, the 1st of July, at which point would the Commission decide to recommend an extension in order to give the Member States more time to agree and therefore open the external borders in a coordinated way? Because time is running out. Thanks. Uh, Yanis, first of all, I would not uh, be able to concur with you that, uh, uh, that, a, um, that there is a fact of, uh, of poor advancement of, uh, of the discussions between member states. This is uh, not something that, um, that, uh, that I, can, um, I can confirm from, from here. As I said, it would be more for colleagues from the Council to, uh, to give you a, a readout or confirm uh, how the discussions between member states are going. From, from our perspective, we um, continue to support member states and work uh, with the intention of, uh, of making a decision as, as soon as possible. And, um, I cannot, for the moment, comment on any, um, any further steps, depending on different scenarios. I think it's a question of keep calm and carry on, Yanis, if I can say. Okay, thank you. I think this closes this chapter. I would like to come back to um, Mira, who had a question on Venezuela, which I overlooked. Mira, you have the floor. Mira. Yes, we can yes, hear birds. We can hear birds. So you should be online. So you should be online. You can hear me then. Yes. Yes. Yes, perfect. So I just wanted to to know if you have more details about this conversation from Mr. Iglesias. 
uh, with uh, Venezuelan actors. And the second question is, the, in the statement from yesterday, uh, you say uh, they are, uh, there are a possibility to, uh, what is exactly the word, to upscaling the international assistance to vulnerable Venezuelans. What do, uh, but, uh, what, what can I, I understand uh, under upscaling? More assistance or other uh, organizations? So. Okay, thank you very much. A question for Virginie. Slight technical issue. Okay, Mira, please. Okay, we've cut you now out of the loop so that Virginie can connect. Um, hello. So thank you, Mira, for your question. Uh, indeed, uh, yesterday we uh, published uh, a press release uh, following uh, the meeting of the international contact group at a senior official level. Um, I uh, will get back to you on your second question, uh, as at this stage I do not have uh, more details to, uh, to give you. Now, in terms of... Um, uh, the, the contacts that uh, uh, Enrique Iglesias uh, um, has maintained uh, in line with, uh, with his role. He has uh, contacts uh, uh, with uh, political actors from different parts uh, in the country, uh, and that is part of, uh, of his mission. Um, I, I don't have any, uh, any details to share uh, as well on that, but of course, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's as usual, he, uh, he ensures uh, contacts um, uh, with all the different uh, uh, bodies uh, in, uh, uh, in Venezuela, as well as with international actors. Merci, Virginie. Let us move now to Jeremy. Jeremy. Hi, a couple of competition questions. Um, I just wondered, could you confirm that you have received a complaint from Ryanair in relation to pr alleged price fixing among six airlines, including Austrian, Air Dolomiti and Alitalia? And second, I just wondered, in relation to the Commission's decision today to give state aid a uh, recap to Lufthansa, uh, there's been comment from Lufthansa, from uh, sorry, from Ryanair, that uh, it's unfeasible that a decision on whether or not this might be overcompensatory could have been made in a week. And I uh, just wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Thank you, Jeremy. This is for Ariana. Hi. Do you hear me? Go ahead, Ariana. Hi. So on, on the first question, I will have to get back to you uh, to check whether we have received uh, the, the complaint from Ryanair. Um, uh, but uh, I, I, will, I will certainly get back um, and perhaps coordinate also with my transport uh, colleagues. Concerning your second question, indeed, uh, today we have a approved the uh, 6 billion uh, euro recapitalization um, notified by Germany in favor of, of Lufthansa, the parent company of the Lufthansa group. I didn't have a chance yet to uh, see the comment uh, from Ryanair, so I will get back to you also on, on that one. Um, Jeremy, I understand from Stefan that we have, um, in uh, we can say now that we have received indeed uh, the letter from uh, from Marinair, but that's all we can say at the at the moment on this uh, cartel, uh, alleged cartel that you were or press fixing that you were mentioning. Okay, let me move on now to Susanna. Uh, good morning. Also for uh, Ariana, I would like, uh, since we are talking about uh, uh, state aid and help to companies, uh, well. Um, 
yesterday the, the Portuguese government said that uh, the state aid solution plan for TAP was imposed by the, the European Commission. So I would like to ask uh, actually who decided that TAP should get help under the guidelines on rescue and restructuring. And uh, well, to be clear, did the European Commission make clear that this was the only legal framework available for TAP? Thank you. Ariana. Hi, hi, Susanna. So, uh, as you know, the Commission does not uh, comment on comments. Uh, what I can say is that it is up to member states to notify measures uh, involving state aid to the Commission and to determine uh, the legal basis under which a measure can be and is ultimately notified. The Commission assesses uh, public support measures and their compatibility with uh, stated rules as they are notified by member states. Specifically, uh, um, concerning in case you were mentioning, uh, on 9th of June, uh, Portugal notified to the Commission its intention to grant a 1.2 billion euro rescue uh, loan to TAP uh, under the Rescuing and Restructuring uh, Commission uh, guidelines. TAP, which has been facing difficulty already before the coronavirus outbreak, which means already before 31st December 2019, was not eligible uh, to receive support under the uh, Commission State Aid Temporary Framework. The Commission therefore assessed the measure under its guidelines uh, on uh, rescue and restructuring in line with the notification uh, by uh, Portugal. The Commission found, as you know, that the notified measure was indeed in line with the conditions set out in the guidelines on rescuing and restructuring, and on this basis approved uh, the measure on 10th of June. Thank you. Ariana, Susanna, you have a follow-up. Yes, so what you're saying is that uh, the government is responsible for the um, uh, framework that was uh, chosen, and there was no other option uh, rather than this one under these guidelines. Mariana. What I'm saying is indeed that Portugal notified uh, the measure uh, under rescuing restructuring guidelines, and this is a legal basis under which the Commission has uh, conducted its assessment. On the other hand, being a company in difficulty before the coronavirus outbreak, which is before 31st December 2019, a TAP was not eligible for aid under the temporary framework. Thank you, Ariane. I think that's very clear. Okay, um, let us move to Oliver. Hi. Good morning. Hi. On, on the airline uh, crisis, uh, I'd be interested in the Commission's general assessment. Would you, what would you make of uh, the assessment that the airlines today are basically where the banks were in 2008, which is badly regulated with insufficient oversight, undercapitalized in spite of actually uh, the legal obligations to provide for uh, rainy days, and that there is the necessity now in Europe to have a fundamental reform of the way that air traffic and the business of, of, of providing airline services is being regulated in Europe. Can you go on with the rules we have in place now? Thank you. And then I also have a question on the Convention on the Future of Europe, but um, I can keep that for later if we have further questions on, on air travel. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, thank you very much, Oliver. I don't think I, I'll, I'll be able to go into um, all the questions that you raise as to whether our aviation sector needs a full reorganization, whether it's ready or not. What I want to say is that we are very well aware that this aviation sector has been particularly hardly hit by the corona pandemic with a very high decrease of uh, flights, as we all know. What I can say is that we are very much aware of this situation. We are talking to the aviation uh, industry and to stakeholders to help the stakeholders as much as possible. And we have taken several measures to help the aviation uh, industry um, overcoming this very important crisis. Uh, in the context of the last weeks and months, many initiatives have been announced, be it in the context of uh, slots, be it in the context of uh, financial support, be it in the context of uh, passenger regulations and passenger rights, rather. Uh, many of these measures have been taken 
precisely as a result of the fact that we very much acknowledge that this sector is going through a very difficult uh, time. Thank you. Oliver, let me add that uh, this, uh, of course, and I think this is what was implied by your question, uh, is not a crisis which is faced only by the aviation sector, but by its uh, customers who, uh, who are counting on the flights that they have booked in order to travel, uh, to travel through, uh, through Europe. We've had ample opportunity of discussing uh, the, um, the different actions which the Commission um, or member states uh, have taken in order to uh, try to address the situation, uh, this crisis situation that we, that we are, are, are going through. And as I've said as well in the past, um, there will be a point in time uh, for, uh, for the different institutions, the member states uh, and us, to come back and look at, uh, at the crisis uh, and its implications and uh, what, uh, what needs to change. Uh, but we are not there at this, uh, at this point in time. We are trying to deal with the issues on the one hand that the airlines face, on the other that the, uh, that the consumers face. You have a follow-up? So, sorry, yeah, thank you. So, sorry to bang on on this, but basically the sector was in crisis already before uh, uh, we had the lockdowns. And that actually during a period in Europe's recent history that was the economically most uh, positive. I mean, you yourself keep, keep, keep repeating and, and quite rightfully so that the economy was doing really well for the last five years. And yet Alitalia is a zombie company for many years. TAP, as we just heard, was already not a profitable business, business before. Austrian Airlines was basically not a profitable business. Uh, Brussels Airlines and so forth and so forth. And that in spite of lots of inherent public subsidies, because every member state is really keen on keeping their airline and so forth and so forth. So what is going wrong in Europe that even during the, the, the biggest economic boom in recent decades, providing air travel is not a profitable business? Thank you. We hear you, Oliver, but um, we, you know, we have said what we have to say on the uh, on the issue at this uh, at this point in time. We're not going to engage into a debate now um, on what are the root causes of the situation of any particular sector in Europe. Economic sectors um, in Europe um, go through good times and bad times. Uh, this is something that is not specific to the aviation sector. It has happened and will continue to happen uh, to many other parts of the, of the economy. Um, regulation uh, is certainly one uh, element that you can look at, but you have to look at lots of other elements as well when you're assessing um, the health uh, and prosperity of any particular sector. Again, um, we believe that at this point in time, uh, the issue that the European Commission has to focus on is managing the very concrete and specific impacts of the crisis that we are going through. Um, and if there are other issues uh, to be raised at a later stage, uh, it, I'm sure that the time for that uh, will come. I see no other questions, so we'd be happy to take your question on the Conference of Europe. Even though, yeah, so, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, I'd be interested in your uh, take on yesterday's agreement by the um, by Corepair, and particularly about member states excluding treaty change of being part of the conference uh, on the convention conference or convention on the future of Europe exercise. My question is, what uses what uses that to have such a uh, an exercise if you a priori exclude? treaty change. And I've also looked at your communication from, I think, January or February on this. I couldn't find any uh, clear statement on whether the Commission is in favor of talking about treaty change or not. So could you clarify, what's the use of having a, a, a debate about the future of Europe if you don't want to change the rule book? And secondly, would you be in favor of, of changing the, the treaties or, or do you think that this is not necessary? Thank you. This is a question for Susanne. Hello, can you hear me? 
Yes, go yes, ahead. The connection working? Fine. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, first of all, on, on the question. And our first comment would be that we are happy that the Council now took a position yesterday and this opens the way to work on a joint declaration between all the three institutions for the Conference of Europe. Uh, this will now take place over the next months and, and we hope to that the Conference of Europe can be started as soon as possible and as the uh, crisis allows. Um, on the particular question, on the question of, of treaty change, I think this is exactly up to the discussion now among the three institutions. As you know, it is a common endeavor to have the conference on the future of Europe. It's, a, it's an initiative which involves all the three institutions on equal footing. And I think we should leave it to the discussion now to see uh, then at the moment we have no specific comment to make on, on this question. Thank you, Susanne. Uh, let me point out that a discussion on um, how Europe functions, uh, uh, again, just like in the, on the previous topic that you were mentioning, uh, can cover very uh, different uh, types of, uh, of issues. And what we have constantly said is what we want to listen to the citizens of Europe and what, to what they have to say as to, uh, uh, as to the way the European Union responds to their uh, needs and to their concerns. And first of all, what are these needs and concerns that, uh, we, should be, that we should be working on? And based on this, uh, there can then be discussions on, uh, on what are the appropriate measures uh, to, be, to be taken. So this will be definitely uh, uh, a developing story. Athanasios. It's not on the future of Europe uh, and the conference. It's on the Marine Strategy Framework Director Report, the one that you published today. And the quote from uh, Commissioner Sinkevicius, who says that he notes with regret that the member states will not achieve the good environmental status they were legally required for 2020, and that for some regions, the efforts that have to be undertaken are substantial. So. In another part of the report, we read that in the Mediterranean, things are worse than in other places. So I was wondering, which are those regions and what efforts should they make? Vivian. Hi, Yes, thank you very much for this question. Indeed, we've published the report today and it, uh, shows as every year what are the uh, re uh, which are the specific regions which need to do more work and um, i think you will have seen when you look at the report in detail that the references there are to uh, various parts of our seas because you see that the um, as we often have the discussions on the fisheries and on the protection of our seas there are <laughs> It's difficult to uh, now point to uh, specific regions because each of the seas has some uh, room for development when it comes to their, uh, their uh, marine protection as well as the situation around the fisheries. Thank you. Are there other questions for us today? It does not seem to be the case, so thank you very much for your participation and we will meet you here again tomorrow. Thank you.